Good afternoon. Good to see you all. Um, my name is J.D. Bridges. I'm the Vice President of Global Outreach here at Ligonier. And I'm joined today by a, a dear friend and brother, uh, Ken Mbugwa, who is pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Nairobi, Kenya. And he's also the managing director of Ecclesia Africa. And so thank you for, for welcoming Ken. Kim, brother, glad you could be here in person. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to, great to have you. So um, our topic is the church in Africa. And before I start to um, engage a little bit with Ken, I, I wanted us to take a step back and just get a, more of a macro view of, of Africa. Africa is quite large. Um, when you, you've likely seen the maps that show all the continents, and you'll see Africa there in the middle. Um, but what's a little deceiving about Africa is that it, uh, it actually isn't, it isn't the size that you normally see it. In fact, it's much larger on scale. And so if you were to look at Greenland, for example, you might think that Greenland and Africa are about the same size. But the reality is that Africa is 14 times larger than Greenland. In fact, if you were to fly from the furthest east point in Africa to the furthest west point in Africa, that would be like flying from Orlando to Honolulu. And then if you were to fly from the furthest south point in Africa and were to fly to the furthest north point, that would be like flying from Seattle to Paris. So Africa is quite large. It is uh, a continent composed of 54 countries spanning um, you know, this massive geographical area. And in addition to that, and more importantly for the sake of our conversation today, it is a continent of 1.3 billion people that speak over 2,100 active languages. Now, if you think about that, that is nearly a third of all spoken languages around the world. And so when we think of Africa, it's easy for us here in the West to just reference Africa as a single point or almost a single entity, but it is very complex. Its contours run deep, and they are quite distinct depending on the different parts of Africa that you're talking about. And so for our time today, we're going to talk about the church in Africa, but hopefully I have set forth that it is quite difficult to speak of it in a very monolithic way. So, Ken, now that we've established that Africa is large and there's a lot of people, um, one statistic that I, I keep encountering that just really stands out to me that I, I think is helpful for us is to consider this, that the average age in Africa is less than 20 years old. And based on our time together, I think that actually explains some of the erratic behavior I saw driving. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of teenagers. Um, so, Ken, help me, help me with this. Um, how does this, this statistic, how, did, how are you seeing this impact and affect the church? So in multiple ways. Um, one, when a continent or a country, in my case, Kenya, is so young, um, it, it means the things that you taught um, or established a couple of decades ago, you need to go ahead and do those things all over again. Um, so there's no assuming the history of um, the church that you're in, where you have maybe taught the gospel, is the reality that you're currently facing, because in many ways you have a totally brand new crop of individuals um, in that congregation, or your city is now filled with um, a whole new population that you need to reproclaim those truths um, to. It also means that the challenges you're facing are very different. Um, so it's going to be younger people who are on social media, who are using their phones a whole lot more, who are a whole lot more um, aware of the things going on in the internet. 
Um, in our case, at least as, as, as Emmanuel Baptist Church in Nairobi, it, it, it also means that there's more people who are a whole lot more educated that you're coming into contact with. Um, at least in our particular um, demographic. So um, the trends as far as language are also changing. With that younger population, it's going to be a smaller population increasingly that are totally dependent on being reached using the vernacular language of where they grew up. So that might have been the case for their mothers um, or their parents or their grandparents. So their grandparents, you'd have had to speak to them only in their mother tongue. Um, a bit less for their parents and quite different for them. So, so that as time, as time passes with the young generation, it is becoming a whole lot more monolithic in that sense. Um, whether it's Kiswahili is going to be able to reach more people, or it's even more people who can now be reached in English, simply because they are younger, far more exposed, um, went to school, and are uh, spending a lot of time on the internet reading on things. Are you seeing, uh, you, you and I, um, discussed yesterday just the tremendous growth that you're seeing in your own church. Are you seeing more young people becoming members even in your own church? Yeah, so it's, it's so useful to, um, to grasp the fact that I think it's Chris Larson that I was mentioning to you the other day who, who posted a tweet saying um, he's finding more and more that ministry has so much more to do with catching up with what the Holy Spirit um, has been doing long before you showed up. Um, so for us, that's absolutely the case. It's, it's, it's not strategies or we are the ones who have done this or that, but I, I think we are seeing, um, uh, I, I call them winds of grace across the country, and I'm seeing this also in multiple other countries in, in Africa, where there seems to be a, a hunger for God's word, and it is showing up amongst young people. There seems to be a, a disgruntled spirit with either attending a church where it feels like it's all about politics, announcements take an hour, um, and, and, and it's all these wrangles in the congregation or just building projects, and, and, and people are, are, are a bit tired of that. And you, you can see a hunger in the young people for for something more, something transcendent, if you so please. So it's not unusual in our case to be invited to a university and for the young people to ask us to preach on the authority of scripture, the sufficiency of scripture, the inerrancy of scripture, and we ask them, oh, who told you about these things? Where did you hear about those words? And for them to give you an answer that does not track back either to your own ministry or the ministry of people that you know, but something that just seems to be a broad um, hungering for, for truth and for God himself. So we have seen that in our church with, with the members that we are voting in. I'd say a majority of those would be uh, people under 30 that keep on coming in. Because Kenya, not only is the average population um, going to be around the age of 20, in Kenya, more than 80% are under the age of 35 so the youth is primarily the people that you're dealing with, and that will only continue to be the case in, in the years to come. So then just thinking about the, um, you know, this tremendous opportunity we have with you know, a, a very young continent, and thinking about how the church obviously will need uh, with this you know, with this amount of people, um, trained pastors, and yet mm. for the next statistic that I want to I want to show you, it's it's really overwhelming to think that ninety five percent of pastors have not been trained in any way, and just can help me understand the challenges that you see, um, you know, these, when you see these numbers, they're, they're, they're staggering. What, what challenges do you see for equipping and training pastors? How did we get to 95%? That's good. That's good. I, I think to some extent it's because maybe the, the growth of the church um, ran past the attempts to equip the church that were currently existing. Um, 
So with an explosion in population growth, um, it simply means that there is far more people out there than there actually are institutions that are trying to either reach them or equip them. Um, that's one. Two, it, I always love to say that we know that there are things God is doing out there, even in that 95% that are untrained, that are beautiful and good and true, right? And we're simply not aware um, of them as much. So that even though in the 5%, we might be aware of strong ministries in places like in Zambia, where the church seems to be quite established. We know that in the 95% as well, a God who is good and loves all of his sheep. Um, we know that in accordance to his providence, he has allowed the gospel to go forth and to do work even amongst the 95% of people who are, um, are not trained or other pastors who are not trained. Um, however, I'd say the, the, there's certain challenges that will exist for the 95%. One would be a, a lack of access to theological resources. So you'll find when it comes to books, for example, there's not much going on on the continent that is um, doing two things, the producing of sound theological resources and the distribution of sound theological resources. So if you, if you, if you come across a book on the continent that's uh, by a Sinclair Ferguson, right, or, or, or um, one of the people that you guys will, will listen to here, right, um, it's likely that that book was either put on a ship and brought in from the West to Africa, or was put on a plane and flown over to the continent of Africa. That's a very inefficient way of getting theological resources to a continent that is that big and with that number of people. Um, so, so the lack of indigenous um, ministries that are working to produce content um, amongst their own people and then distribute that content in in, in, in local ways, just like putting those con that content on border borders. We don't have an Amazon, right? Or a UPS, which I hear is hanging around here waiting to ship books for you uh, Ken, back home. Ken just mentioned a border border. Ken, could this you tell us true. what a border border is? My apologies for that. Um, I was back home for a minute. Um, a a border border is a, a little motorcycle. So there's a whole bunch of those from China um, in our context. So think of India and all those little... Um, Motorcycles, that's, that's what I'm talking about, as, as a means of um, quickly sending resources from one point to, to another. So because of the lack of theological resources, it's meant that most pastors, even most ministries, most individuals who are trying to equip pastors are starved of the resources necessary to be able to properly equip, equip those pastors. Even something as basic as Bibles. Um, quite recently, we were talking to a very solid and sound um, ministry partner in the coastal part of our country. And with our training program, which we highly subsidize to be able to train people for $3.50, he was telling me, Ken, they can't pay that $3.50 because the, the guy that you're trying to get to do that is a guy who's trying to preach from the book of Exodus and can't because he doesn't have that book in his Bible. Um, so where I'm at, it's not like that. I mean, I have all of John Owen's volumes on my shelf. I have a ton of books, but that's Nairobi. And that's, again, the complexity you were talking about. Um, somebody like me in a city like where I'm at and the colleges that are there, you have access to a lot. But that falls into that 5%. But when you move into that 95% or the 90% or 85% of pastors who don't have access like I do because of where I am, the discrepancy in access to theological resources is huge. So that I have multiple Bibles, many pastors do not have a good Bible to be able to preach from, let alone a study Bible that they can use to be able to at least train themselves a little bit as they're trying to feed their flock. And that's also important to note when we speak about the state of theology in, on the continent. So that for most pastors, it's so easy for us to accuse them of, um, of being heretics or of preaching um, a false gospel, but for many of them, they're simply doing what they have been taught or what they have seen on TV. Um, and that's what they're replicating in their own context. They've not quite had a, a fair chance to hear the truth, to read books that are proclaiming the truth, and to be able to choose for themselves which path to actually take. Because again, it's a very large percentage that do not have much access to training or to theological resources. Help us understand how Ecclesia Africa is addressing the needs there. 
So as one of many different ministries on the continent that are um, seeking to put a dent on, on those statistics, we are trying to do the two things that I've just mentioned. One, create resources. So um, we are trying to do two things with that. Instead of getting African churches or, or rather Western churches or Western ministries to ship books over to Africa, we've, we've started a publishing company and with a lot of help from Ligonier, Crossway, Nine Marks, um, just different partners who have taught us the ropes on what to do actually when it comes to a, um, a publishing company that allows us to be able to sign copyrights for good books that you all have access to here and to be able to print them locally in Nairobi and then distribute them from there to other parts of, of Africa. So that's one of the portions of creating resources. The other one is we don't really want to keep printing Western books on things like what is the gospel, what is the church, right? Um, those are truths that African believers know. There are many African pastors that God has raised up across the continent um, who are faithful men uh, proclaiming God's word soundly. And we want, as a publishing uh, ministry, to start getting African authors to write um, biblical content for an African audience addressing African issues, right? Um, and so you, you'll have examples. A good example is one of our brothers, um, elder amongst us, the same way you guys would speak about an RC over here. Um, I would be speaking about a Conrad Mbewe um, in, in Africa, just good, strong preaching of God's word. But when he wrote a book, right, it had to be published by who? By Crossway in Wheaton, Illinois, right? Um, and that's our guy. So our hope is that as a small ministry that we would be able to mature and be able to get men like that and others on our continent writing, we publish them locally, and be able to spread their content. And then the other side is distribution. So not only creating the resources, but it's really about getting the resources out. So instead of simply taking good books and handing them over um, to pastors, because pastors always like books, and I have been to people's houses who have attended our conferences and now have an array of theological resources. But when you ask them, how many of those books have you read? Not one, or maybe just one, right? Because you'd like seeing them, but reading them is a different thing. So we don't just want to get into the business of making people's shelves look nice. We want to get that content into the hearts of people because of the, the word that was just said here, right? Um, I, I, I noted it down um, as I was taking notes. Because you're praying for an awakening. And, and you're praying that as people come into contact with the truth about God, that's when everything changes. So we take that content and we organize it into different curriculums. If we take a good book from a crossway or Reformation Trust, uh, we try and develop a study guide to go along with it. Um, and then when we send it out, we ask the pastors especially to read those books in cohorts so that they read the book, they go through the study questions to make sure that they get the heart of the book. Um, and then they write a one page paper about the thing that impacted them the most from that book and then they meet up. Uh, we require monthly, but most of the groups meet up more than once a month to discuss the contents of that book. Um, and so all you're doing is, it is not so much about who the author was, um, it's you're looking for books that are articulating the truth of God's word, because that's what we need. Um, it's basically like shipping out lecturers, right? Some of your best lecturers, both in Alive Today here in the US, or even those who are long dead and you allow African pastors in, in, in places where they formerly did not have access to now be able to interact or to learn from God's word from some of the best teachers that God has blessed the church with um, and impact them with that truth on, in all these different channels, reading it, studying it, writing it, and then discussing it. And, and they do this month by month with a different book for four years. It's really a, an amazing program. And just to give us a, give us a sense of the scale of that, um, I know you and I have had several conversations, yeah. but help them understand. Yeah, so as with every program, you start off and, and there's multiple challenges, um, and ours was no different. So we, we drafted this curriculum down, um, had 12 books for the first year, a 12 for the next year, and on and on. Um, and with the first two years, we were just struggling to get the program established. Last year, um, 2020 of all years, um, when we felt like our program was pretty much dead, um, and we all turned out the lights and just went to sleep, um, like in March. We wake up in June um, to inquire from our network leaders how the program is going. 
waiting for the worst news ever, and we're just surprised by how God just does not need us. Uh, because when we were doing nothing, just licking our wounds, um, discouraged, depressed, God was building his church. Um, so we came back in June with the, the most encouraging report we've ever had about how our summer program um, has been going. And pastors managed to pivot one way or another, hard-working, um, church-loving network leaders out there, found ways of traveling to their pastors um, and helping them walk through, walk through the book. So last year we wrapped up with just 100 pastors, but it was the most successful year for our program. But coming into this year, the Lord just allowed um, for there to be so many pastors who got interested in it. By the time we wrapped up February, the group had doubled in number, um, and we were at 200. And right now we are looking at adding most probably a couple of more hundred before the, the year is over. So there seems to be a hunger and a thirst out there, especially amongst the poorer communities. So not pastors like me in the city with access to theological training and theological resources. Those guys are not interested in SOMA, right? Um, but when you go to the slum areas where pastors don't have as much access, or you go to the rural areas where there's still a majority of pastors and churches and the population is going to be, there's such a hunger and a yearning for theological resources and theological training. So we are thankful that the Lord is seeming to bless our efforts to get the good stuff to those guys. That's great. That's, that's great, brother. Um, looking at our next statistic, um, for the sake of the time that we have left, can approximately 50% of all people throughout Africa would claim to be Christian. Now, I want to nuance this just a little bit. If you think of the complexity that we've talked about already with Africa, you know, if you're thinking about northern Africa, you, you're going to encounter single digits uh, in terms of people who would claim to be Christian or even identify as Christian. But when you move to sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers actually grow much larger, uh, and those percentages are even greater than 50%. And so, Kent, help us, um, help us make sense of that. Those numbers seem, again, very high. Um, how did those correlate to your experience? 50%, 80%? So... Um, I, just, I love how you set up this conversation because I hope it, it helps us grasp the complexity of the conversation we're having. So when a, con a continent is that big, the countries are that many, the languages are that many, um, you're speaking about a lot of diversity um, in all of that. So when you speak about a 50% um, on the continent who claim to be Christians, it looks different in different places. So in our country specifically, there's almost 80%. It's a little less than 80% who will claim to be Christian. Um, and what that will look like in the city is, is a very cultural Christianity, right? Um, people who their parents were reached by the missionaries, and let's say it was Anglican missionaries who reached them, and their parents attended the Anglican church, and now they are just committed to the Anglican church, or the Baptist church, or the Presbyterian church, and that's what they say. Us, we are Anglicans. Us, we are Baptists. And it's almost like rooting for um, a football team, kind of a deal. It's, it's not so much a claiming um, an allegiance or a faith, a trust in Jesus and, and saying, you know, I am a Christian. I trust in the work that he did for me on the cross. I cannot wait to behold his face on that last day, right? That's not what they're saying when they say, I'm a Christian. It's, it's an affiliation to a denomination. Um, so that's what it looks like, especially in the city, um, for the majority. Obviously, in that percentage, there are true uh, believers who are walking in repentance and faith towards, um, towards the Lord. But in those churches, what you'll find is a whole lot more members on their books than actually attending church on Sunday. So when you come to church on Sunday, it's going to be a smaller group. But when you come to their books, it's half the city. Um, is, is in those books, and they'll claim, no, I'm a member of that particular church, haven't been there in a long time, um, as opposed to here and there. When you go to really rural places, I have been to, um, to a country north of us where people will still say they're Christians, and they live and die for their Christianity because they're being persecuted uh, by, by, by the northern part of, of, of their country. And in the village I was in, they would be wearing a large wooden cross because of their identifying with Christianity, being willing to even suffer for that. 
Um, and yet when we ask those questions about what is the gospel, you do not really get a biblical answer. Um, so again, it's become, the Christianity has, has, has become an identity that is in many ways apart from the, the Christ of, of the scriptures. And, and even though in that context there's actually a lot of pain and suffering that they have experienced, the, the sad part is when you're articulating what the Bible teaches, um, you, you, you just hear very different answers. So in that particular case, they totally believed that when you get baptized, the water of baptism is what is actually washing away um, your sins. And we were laboring for multiple weeks, trying to show them from the scripture how that is actually not the case. But they are still attend church. Um, they have a pastor who goes around from village to village teaching. They sing songs. Um, but the truth, the biblical truth, um, is still what is lacking. In, in many of those contexts. And, and so the work remains the same in a context where there's so much Christianity or cultural Christianity that actually becomes the biggest problem because now you're talking to people oftentimes who already think they're Christian. So when you're articulating to them the truth of God's word, they're like, been there, done that, bought a t-shirt. But in reality, they have not come into contact with the God of the Bible, right? Um, as he revealed himself through his son, as you're proclaiming it through... Um, through the gospel. So in many cases, you're trying to unteach people before you can actually start teaching them um, what God's truth actually is. Mm. Well, for the time that we have left, um, I think it's important that we, we start to look forward. Um, in one sense, statistics are, are helpful um, to a certain degree, right? I mean, we could, we could quote statistics all day, um, when, especially when it comes to Africa. And yet, I think for the sake of um, our final minutes here, I want to just put in front of you this um, as a takeaway. And then, Ken, I've, I've got a, a follow-up question for you. But over the next 30 years, um, there will be an additional 2 billion souls that will be added to the planet. Over half of those will come from Africa. And so Africa's population will double in the next 30 years. What that means is this. Try to get your mind around it. That's like adding China today to Africa. All the people in China today, adding those to Africa. It is just almost impossible to get your mind wrapped around the number of people that that represents. Um, you know, and another thing that I think we need to keep in front of us, too, as we think about Africa, is also this idea of the global south. And so when we look to the global south, one thing that uh, we're seeing is that probably within the next 10 to 15 years, the global south will eclipse the global north, with the, which the United States is part of, in terms of sending missionaries around the world. Now, if you think about that, that is a very daunting um, consideration, isn't it? If we're talking about how unequipped and how unresourced um, so many of our brothers and sisters in this part of the world are, and we're talking about adding another 1.3 billion people to this continent alone, and yet this is where we're seeing the majority of missionaries that will be sent going out in the future, over the, again, over the next 10 to 15 years, then I think it begs the question, what can we be doing? How can we support the work that's happening and going to happen in Africa? And Ken, that's my question for you. How would you encourage us to think about Africa and supporting Great Commission activity, Great Commission work, going forward? That's a good question. Um, one, I would say, which this would be the case if any of my, my dear friends or, or brothers were here um, with me at a conference like this, um, where when we sing crown him with many crowns and you feel like we could stop, you know, we could finish that song and go home um, just because of how edifying um, just that truth is. In, it's impossible to sing a song like that without 
without desiring, right, for more people um, on the continent to be able to sing like that, isn't it? Um, to be able to say Jesus is Lord, um, to be able to say um, Hosanna, right, um, hallelujah. So I would say how to think about it would start off with um, when you eat a good feast, right, of God's word being proclaimed to you. And you just think to yourself, oh, how good that was. Um, I think it would be helpful to, to pray a prayer um, even then, as you're giving thanks for that rich feast, um, to pray a prayer for your brothers, right, and for your sisters um, who are going to be born, right, as Christ prayed even for those who had, um, were not yet born, but he's praying not only for his disciples but also for, for those who will come. But, but pray that the Lord would do a strong work on the continent um, so that as, as we gather here to rejoice about an RC, there would come a day when we would gather to rejoice about um, the myriads of African men that the Lord has raised up on that continent and the myriads of healthy churches that are on that continent. And then lastly, resources, resources, resources. Because it's all about this book. That's all you can actually give us. Um, you can't give us anything else. So those are the two things that I'd say. Pray for us and whatever you can do, um, send resources to the continent. Well, that concludes our, our time here this afternoon. So good to be with you all. Please uh, extend an asante sana. Thank you. Thank you very much.